I pausen så viste vi et bilde med overskriften «Vennlighet i redd liv». Det her kommer det fra en bevegelse som heter «Civility saves life» med, med rot i Skottland. Og det her det er en bevegelse som prøver å gjøre det viden kjent at det å være ufin mot en kollega kan føre til at kollegaen presterer dårligere, glem bort arbeidsoppgaver og i verste fall føre til pasientskader. Han Chris Turner han er en av grunnleggerne av denne bevegelsen. Han er lege i akuttmedisin ved University of Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, a warm welcome to Chris Turner, who is joining us not from Scotland, but from Dubai, I believe. Yes, indeed. I am, I am on holiday, apparently, this week. <laughs> Thank you. Chris Turner, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, Ina. Um, it is lovely to be here. I'm going to share my screen. And just bear with me for one second, just whilst I do this. And hopefully you guys can now see when we permit rudeness, our patients die unnecessarily. And let me just get rid of that. So I'm going to tell some stories. I'm going to tell you a little bit um, about the, the data that sits behind why behaviour matters in, in our complex world. And everything I tell you will be true where they involve me You'll know it's me because I'll say it's me. If it involves somebody else, there's no way you could recognize them. The first time that I can remember thinking maybe I'm too soft to work around here was in the early 90s. And I was working in Glasgow. I was covering a colleague who was um, on holiday and and what was happening was I, I was going on to their award and doing some stuff. And I, I arrived one morning and at the other end of the ward was the consultant who saw me and started steaming towards me. His eyes were bulging and he got to me and he showed me the prescription card. And he said, was this you? And I said, yes, because I recognized my writing. And apparently I'd got something wrong. I don't remember exactly what he told me I'd got wrong at the time, but what happened next was he said, how dare you, how unprofessional, I'm so angry. You could have caused this person to go blind. And then he left. And he left and I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. I was shaken. I, I was unable to think when he was talking to me, never mind defend myself. And I went and I found a colleague and I, I said to her, I said, what was that all about? And she said, that's just how he is. You just need to suck it up and cope. But I spent the rest of my day in a kind of dazed state. And I remember thinking, you know, am I too soft to work around here? And by the way, I hadn't got it wrong. I had copied what had been there previously. But hey. And sometimes we spend our days wondering what the hell just happened. So healthcare is a team business. We deliver it in complicated and sometimes complex environments, and we do it with varying outcomes. And for 10 of the last, uh, of the last 16, 17 years, as well as being an emergency medicine consultant, I was a governance lead. I was investigating and trying, trying to find out what happened when things went wrong. And... If you come to me at the beginning of that time and you said, hey, Chris, you know, what do you think the problem is? What do you think the answer is? I would have been really clear. I would have said to you, it's process. If only everybody did what they're meant to do. But then I started to investigate these things that went wrong. I did the root cause analysis. And what I was discovering was that the people who were at the end of these chains, the people who did the supposedly wrong thing, these were often really good, hardworking, knowledgeable, frequently very kind individuals. And yet here they were, the bad object. And I began to realize I must be missing something. And what I think I was missing was this. Process exists on a piece of paper. But practice, practice happens between you and me and it happens in an environment. And I simply wasn't respecting the complexity that that adds into our ability to do our job. 
So now if people ask me, you know, what do you think the issue is, Chris? What do you think the answer is when these things go wrong? I still think process is important. We should be able to describe how we would do something on a good day with a following wind with you know, no impediments to us doing our job. But something else is more important. And that's people and how we treat each other. And I think the evidence bears me out on this. But for clarity, I, I know this is a safety conference, but I'm not really talking about the avoidance of error. Because if we wanted to avoid error, if that was the number one thing that happened when we came to work, there is only one way of guaranteeing that we guaranteeing that we can avoid error at work. And that is when we wake up in the morning, you turn on your phone, you phone into work and you tell them you're not coming. Because every day when we go to work, there is risk in the things that we do. What I'm really talking about is how can we set ourselves up to perform at our very best? Because that way, we know that we make less mistakes. Also, we aspire to excellence. And I think that's what most of us do when we go to work. We aspire to excellence. A couple of minutes ago, I said, healthcare is a team business and we deliver in complicated and sometimes complex environments. But what do I mean by that? And I wouldn't have been able to answer this till I went to a talk by a guy called David Rook. And David Rook has one of Harvard Business Review's top 10 downloaded papers on leadership. And he showed us a graph. And I'm going to show you a version of that because it changed, it changed how I thought about how we do healthcare and particularly how we educate. And along the bottom, I've got certainty about the solution to a problem. We're going from high certainty, so we really know the answer, to low certainty, where we're not so sure. And I'm going to put four boxes above it. The first one is a simple puzzle, two plus two. Everybody knows what the problem is. We all know what the answer is. <coughs> Excuse me. Then a hard puzzle. So a hard maths problem. Now, you might not be able to do it just now, but if somebody taught you, you would get the skills to do this maths problem and then you'd be able to do it. You can do it on your own once you have the skills. And then we get to complicated. And complicated is a bit different. A bit different. An example of this would be a cardiac arrest. Now, I have the skills to do every single job in a cardiac arrest. But if I turn up at a cardiac arrest and there is nobody else there, that is not going to be a good cardiac arrest. And the reason for that is because whilst one person might have all the skills, actually you need all these things to be happening simultaneously in a short period of time. And that means that we have to have lots of different people doing them. That's the only way it gets done in the time period that we have available to us. So in these complicated situations where we have to work with other people, either the volume of work is too great or the time allowed is too short. But importantly, we're all aiming for the same outcome. And then there's complex. And in complex situations, we have to work with other people. But what happens in complex situations is sometimes we are aiming for different outcomes and we don't know it. Sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. And this happens in our organizations when our organizations, which have finite resource, start aiming for one target, for example, and then simultaneously aiming for another target. And what happens is that we feel that we're getting resources to go in this direction, then we get there are resources going in a different direction, but because, because we're, we have finite resource, we start to pull one across or the other across. And it feels frustrating and it feels really difficult to, to function within. But it is the reality of limited resources and trying to hit two different targets from that. And sometimes in these complex situations, we think everybody's going in the same direction, but the truth is they have different things they are aiming for. And it's worth thinking about where do we get results in healthcare and what do we test? And I would put it to you that many of us got to be here today watching this because we have been tested and shown to be really knowledgeable. The problem with that is that what have we, we've been tested on? We have been tested in exam halls on our ability to know the answer on our own not with other people. You're positively discriminated against if you start asking people for help in exam halls. In exam halls, it's all about what's inside my head, your head. And the thing about this is if we can answer it on our own, 
and do it all ourselves, then it is by definition a simple puzzle or a hard puzzle. And that is all about personal mastery. But where do I get my results in healthcare? And I would say to you, it's actually in the complicated and complex part where I have to work with other people. And that's different. That's all about team mastery. And the skill set required for personal mastery, that skill set about cramming all that knowledge in, and the skill set required for team mastery are different. They're not mutually exclusive. You can have both of them. But we have a tendency to invest more and more and more in personal mastery and not so much in team mastery. And I think that that is to our disadvantage. So a couple of things happen as we go up the graph. I mean, the first one's fairly obvious. It's an increasing need for teamwork, but the second one's different. And it's about this idea that you can't see it from all the angles when you're in the complicated and complex part. And what happens there? when we're in the complicated and complex part, is that we have to share information with other people. Now, when we're sharing information with other people, we have to find out how they think about things. So this is Shuli. I'm married to Shuli. Shuli is also an emergency medicine consultant. Um, she is senior to me. Um, she is, by her own admission, smarter to me. And, and I've got to tell you that we don't work in the same organization. Uh, she, you don't get to be the boss at home and at work. And Shuli and I, Shuli and I share a lot. We obviously, um, we have house, cars, kids, all that stuff. And I know her very well. And what we tend to think is that if we know somebody really well, we can understand where they're coming from. And one of the things here is that in the situation where, in the situation where it's complicated or complex. Other people have different different ideas to us. Um, and what that does, guys, I'm really sorry, but I'm getting all the conversation that's going on backstage in my ears. Um, and it's really difficult for me to concentrate. Um, so what happens is that in these settings, we, in these settings, we need to share information with other people. And we're often told to do the same thing. What we're, what we're told to do is to imagine it from somebody else's perspective. There's a problem with that. It doesn't work. This is what happens. So here's my problem. And I look at it, I'm thinking, okay, that, that's this complicated or complex thing. And I'm looking at it from my angle. And then I think, okay, so how does Shuli see this? So I swing my lens around and I look at it from a different angle. And I say to myself, aha, so that's how Shuli sees the problem. Only it's not. When we do that, what's happening is that when we do that, what's happening is that we're imagining how they see something. And we do it with all our unconscious biases because they're unconscious. We're unable to um, we're unable to think about think about them because we can't take them into account. And it turns out that if we really want to know how other people think about something, then we have to do two things. The first thing is we need to ask them, and the second thing is we need to listen to their answer. And what this means is people then give us more information. And then perhaps the right answer changes as we understand more things. And we need to adapt. We need to change our ideas. The problem with that is that many of us, for many of us, that feels like backing down, giving in, and we're really invested in being right. And sometimes we are more interested in proving ourselves to be right than in doing the right thing. And they're not the same. And this is what happens when people try and dominate each other. They don't accept that there's a middle ground where the right answer is. They just try and win. And I see this happening frequently. And I'm sure you guys do in hospitals as well. And outside hospitals. And what we know is that in complicated and complex situations, Information sharing is the most important factor determining performance. In many situations, it's more important than individual skill. It's what do we know determines what we can decide to do next. And we only get that when people share information. And this was proven um, 
way back in 2015 by Riskin and Eris, who did a bunch of simulation studies looking at neonatal peri-arrests. And what they did in these neonatal peri-arrests is they got teams of doctors and nurses who were matched for ability, and they looked at the performance of these guys, and they found that people graded on a curve, as you'd expect, from the catastrophic teams who really had poor outcomes to the amazing outcomes that other teams other teams managed to achieve. And that 40 to 60% of the variance here is down to one thing. And that is information sharing. Teams that shared more information had better outcomes. Teams that shared less information had worse outcomes. And the most important factor determining whether or not people shared information was civility. How did they treat each other? When people treated each other well, they turned on the flow of information. When they treated each other poorly, they simply turned it off. And what good leaders and good team members seem to be doing is turning on this flow of information. So rudeness, incivility, if it's such a big deal, how come I went to Edinburgh Medical School in the 1980s and nobody ever mentioned it? In fact, my medical school, like many other medical schools, felt like a dirty, grey Victorian incivility and arrogance factory. That's what we made. We made it on industrial scales and then exported it. I did my membership in surgery and emergency medicine. Nobody ever mentioned how we treat each other. And I did my fellowship in emergency medicine. And not once did we talk about the impact that behaviour has on performance. And there's a reason for that. We didn't know. There weren't studies into this. Between 1996 and 2001, the whole of academia, there were only 23 studies on the impact of behaviour on performance. Between 2011 and 2016, there were 1,700, and they pretty much all say the same thing. Behaviour matters. So have you seen rudeness at work? Maybe to you? Maybe to somebody near you? Maybe it's been by you. It's certainly been by me far too many times. When somebody was rude to you, how did it feel? How did it feel when somebody was rude to you? And I bet for many of you, when you think about it, you feel angry. But interestingly, that's not how we seem to feel in the moment when it happens. In the moment when somebody treats us rudely, disrespectfully, with incivility, we feel belittled, ashamed, humiliated. We feel powerless and we feel childlike. And then gradually, sometimes over seconds, sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, days, weeks, months, even years, we make sense of it. And then we get angry. And we say, how dare you? And you can think about incivility as some being somewhere on this wedge of threat. So not all threat is the same. Some threat is huge. So you see somebody pulling a knife out of their pocket, that is, that is going to trigger a huge threat response from us. But at the other end of this wedge of threat, there are the people who shake their head when you speak, who pinch their nose, who roll their eyes. And these are behaviours that we're not quite sure what they're meant to mean, but we know we don't like them. And they trigger the start of threat within us. Physiologically, we start to divert a little bit of blood away from our brain to our, towards our body. And psychologically, we start to think in a more negative, more hostile way. And you can measure the impact that that has on people. So on the recipient, in the moment when somebody treats us in a negative way, we have on average a 61% reduction in our cognitive ability. And that lasts for varying lengths of time. And that's really interesting because if I behave in this way to the guys in my team, what happens is that the guys in my team are now going to think less well. But there's something else that's going to happen as well. They're going to be less likely to share information with me. And if they do, they're not as smart as they, they could be. And I think lots of us know bosses who behave like this. I don't believe they behave this way deliberately. I think what happens is that people be behave that way because they've seen other people role modeling it. And in my experience, once people know the impact it has, if they recognize it in themselves, they simply stop doing it. it has an impact on staff onlookers. Just witnessing incivility results in about a 20% decrease in people's cognitive performance. There's actually much more than that. If we witness incivility between two people, not part of us, we, we are not part of this. We're just watching it. 
If we witness it and then we walk around the corner and somebody asks us for help, we're a full 50% less likely to help that person. This negative behavior is literally contagious. But there's one group of people who are more likely to be rude, to be uncivil than anybody else. And they don't all look like this guy. They're bosses, people in positions of authority. Something happens to us when we get into positions of authority and we change. Dacher Keltner, Paul Pith, a bunch of other people look at this. We are three times more likely to sit in a meeting using our computer for something other than that meeting, three times more likely to interrupt people and three times more likely to raise our voices at folk. And we weren't like that before we became bosses. And it can sound like we are treating leadership as the right to behave as we like, but I don't think that's what's happening. I think what's happening is that when we get into leadership positions, we realize the enormity of what we have to do and we move into command and control and we micromanage people, but they don't like it because actually nobody likes being micromanaged, but it gives us a sense of control. Interestingly, when people are then found to be wise leaders, often later in their careers, people who are regarded as being wise leaders tend to all do the same thing. They move from command and control into a, a style called asking, not telling. And what these people are doing is they're asking great questions, they're getting the information, and then they're using their wonderful leadership brain in order to come up with the best ideas. Okay, so let's pull it together. This is 1959. It's the hospital called the Western General in Edinburgh. The system I work in, the NHS, is 11 years old at this point. And that's my mum. On my mum's left is Charlotte. On my mum's right is Julie. My mum and Charlotte and Julie are like many of us, bonded, bonded through healthcare and providing care for other people in often the worst days of their lives. And my mom and Charlotte and Julie, my mom's still alive, but Charlotte and Julie are both dead. They were, they were still seeing each other up until their 80s because healthcare is like that. But back in 1959, twice a day, it was my mom's job to clean the ashtrays, one of which was built into every single bedside cabinet. Doctors told patients that smoking was good for the nerves. You could buy asthma cigarettes. And I like to think that after the doctor spoke to patients and said smoking was good for the nerves, my mom would follow up. She said, hey, patient, do you smoke? The patient would go, no. My mom would say, would you like to try one? She hates it when I say that. Then what happened? Then we discovered the terrible toll that tobacco takes on health and we changed. We changed what we do as healthcare providers and gradually and with other levers in society, smoking is less and less common. So now it's 2024. We're beginning to understand the impact that behavior has on performance. And that's great. What a wonderful opportunity. Because by choosing to behave in ways that value and respect the people around us, what happens is we help people to reach their peak as individuals. And then as teams, we start to share information with each other, which means that we get better outcomes. Better outcomes for patients, but also for staff and even for organizations. Or in other words, civility saves lives. Guys, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to stop sharing. And I suspect that Ina and I will be speaking in a second or two. Uh, yeah, Chris, can you hear me? I can. Thank you. I can see two of me as well. That's really freaky. <laughs> um, thank you so much. You know, the story you started with um, in your introduction um, with with your experience with a colleague, I think all healthcare professionals, well, many if not all, can recognize that story in some degree. Um, I have some questions for you if you have the time. Of course. Uh, so the first question is: What can we as healthcare professionals do to make civility a natural part of day-to-day -day work? Any thoughts? Okay, so the very first thing we have to do is make it valuable to healthcare staff. So the evidence around this is that just by talking about it, we begin to change how people behave. People are not deliberately offensive to each other. What, what's going on is people are stressed and they're responding in a stressed fashion. Once people know the impact that incivility has on the performance of others. The evidence is that many people simply choose to behave differently. So 
the educational impact of talking about this is actually pretty big. It, in a study by uh, Anna Baverstock in maternity units, she took the percentage of people who believed that behaviour mattered in the context of those maternity units from 60% to 100% over the course of a year. The percentage of people who said that they had seen uncivil behaviour in the preceding two to four weeks went from 70% when they started to 50% when they ended. What that says to me is that people, once people think this matters, they go, OK, if they're, if they're self-aware, they go, I'm not going to re respond like that. I'm going to try and control myself a little bit more. And that feels to me like a really good starting place, just making this stuff important to staff, not by saying you must behave civilly, but by saying when we behave in an uncivil fashion, the people around us don't perform as well as they might do. And in fact, there's some evidence that the person who's being rude also doesn't perform as well as they might do. So that's a starting place for me. Absolutely, a great answer. Um, you actually answered my second question in that answer. So I think we're gonna, gonna wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Chris Turner, for your, your great insights, your great advice. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you in Dubai. Enjoy your thank vacation. Thank you, a complete privilege. I would sooner be with you guys. Straight up, I really would. If you saw Buddha today, I'm not sure you would agree. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Have a lovely day. Bye now.